started. And today we're talking about extended adolescence. And essentially this is commonly known as launching, uh, although I really have um, a, a bug about uh, failure to launch. I really can't stand that term. Um, but I do think we're talking about how to usher kids through uh, adolescence into um, emerging adulthood. And emerging adulthood is a term that's also, uh, it's also sometimes interchange, interchanged with extended adolescence. Sometimes people are called young adults, although um, kids themselves don't really love that because it's sort of associated with young adult literature, which is really like tweens. And if you're 17, you don't want to be called a young adult. So I'm going to stick with emerging adulthood um, because that's what's happening with our kids. They are emerging into adults. Hi, Jessica. Hi, Dee. So um, welcome, everybody. So I thought I would chat a little bit about our topic, and then we can get into the meat of your situation and questions you may have about uh, how to parent um, older adolescents and how to help them become more self-reliant uh, adults. So first of all, I want to talk about helicoptering and scaffolding. So helicoptering we, 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 is sort of a term that emerged in the 90s and the aughts, I guess they're called, for parents who were super involved in their kids' lives, over-involved, to be honest, in their kids' lives. And so it's more, it's, it's supervising our kids' activities. We're engaged as parents invested and invested in the tasks and, and the outcomes of things that our kids are doing. We're directing things to go in a certain way, getting involved or doing things for kids instead of letting kids try to do this on their own first. And I say we because I am the parent of two children. My daughter, age 22, will be graduating um, in a couple weeks from college after you know a little bit of a bumpy ride my son is 26 and i just wrote this article it just came out and i'm going to put the link here it's through uh, the psychotherapy networker and it's an article that i wrote about um extend it, it sort of in what i call a moving beyond the empty nest so it's for family matters and it's about you know, redefining parenting at this age. So I want you to check it out. I hope you like it. So we talked a little about helicoptering. So helicoptering is like you're hovering, you're involved, you're watching what's going on. You have a say, or you want to have a say about what your kids are doing. This is very different from scaffolding. Scaffolding is providing resources. It's discussing options and letting kids choose which ones they want to do. It's following up and exploring what's getting in the way of them following up, doing what they need to, or completing something. And it's continuing to teach skills. So the difference, as far as I can see, in helicoptering is, is, and, and scaffolding is the level of engagement. So when our kids are younger, and if we have kids who are diverse learners, we are going to be more engaged. Even when, if we have kids who are more typical learners, we're going to be more engaged. That's part of having children. But over time, we teach them the, these, these various executive functioning skills. We reteach them, we circle back, and we help nurture what I call connected independence. So what is connected independence? So connected independence is the goal for parenting at this stage. And it's a, it's when emerging adults see caring, uh, they're caring adults like their parents or their godparents or their, 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 um, their foster care parents who assist them and offer advice when they seek it, who demonstrate empathy regardless of the situation and who believe in the kids' abilities to make choices. Parents are there for you, but they're not running the show. B asks, is helicopter parenting bad? I don't think helicopter parenting in and of itself is, is bad. Again, I'm not really into the good or bad dichotomy. I'm talking about what works and what doesn't. And helicopter parenting actually um, doesn't necessarily foster the skills for independent living that we ultimately want, because we as parents are pretty involved. So one of the, the challenges that we need to think about is while launching your teen can be exciting, it's also nerve wracking as is your son or daughter or um, 
or prepares to leave the shelter of high school or even college or vocational program, a gap year, trade school or something else, it's hard for us parents to understand when to support them and when to let go. What are the signs that indicate they're ready for the independence they desire, but actually may not have the capacity for? And so answers to these questions can be found by looking at how cognitive development, emotional maturity, and psychological issues affect members of the family, not just the emerging adult. Um, teens with ADHD often need more support for longer than is typically expected for this scaffolding to be successful, but they must participate in its design because when parents say, this is how you're going to do it, period, no, no discussion. It doesn't include the idiosyncrasies of how their teen's brains work. And this is particularly important for teens with ADHD. They want to have a say because they spend so much of their lives listening to other people tell them what they should or shouldn't do and how they should or shouldn't do it. And those solutions may not actually work with how their brains think. So when we, pra when we as parents practice the five C's approach that I talk about in my book, What Your ADHD Child Wishes You Knew, it's in my ADHD solution deck, and you can find a lot about it on my website, of course, um, we foster smoother transitions to adulthood. So let's take a pause right now. And I'd love to hear from you a little bit about your uh, older adolescents. Where are they? What are they doing? What are some of their strengths? And what are some of their challenges? So tell me a little bit, like Brenda did, about her 17-year-old who's graduating from high school. Congratulations. Going to Project Search afterwards for the 21-22 school year. So excited. So that's fantastic. Tell me about your older adolescent and what they're doing right now. I'd really like to hear that. So in the meantime, what I'm going to talk about is um, how our kids test us. They need to learn from experience. And one of the challenges for us as parents is tolerating the discomfort of watching them learn from experience. And I know this to be true for both my kids. Um, you know, when my son was a junior in high school, he had, had was for the, had the privilege of becoming a captain at, on the soccer team. He loved soccer as a junior, and the er, early in the season, he went to a game with the senior a, a party with the seniors where there was alcohol. The police came and he lost his captainship, and he also was benched for four games. And this was a very significant event in his life, and I couldn't do a thing about it. All I could do was listen and support him and love him and just hang in there while he was really a bear for quite a while. Of course, he ended up writing his college essay about it. It was a tremendous learning experience. Now, we don't necessarily want this type of, we wouldn't say, oh yeah, that's a good learning experience. Go to a party where there's alcohol that's in your underage, get caught and lose your captainship. That's really gonna teach you about life. No, we don't wanna do that, but we have to tolerate our desire to fix it. And that was really the challenge. I couldn't talk to the coach about it. I could encourage my son to talk to the coach. And that's what I did. And that's what he did. So it was a really interesting experience. So I'd love to hear Jeanette's telling me that her son got an apprenticeship. Fantastic. Um, I want to hear what your kids are doing, uh, where they are, and perhaps some of the challenges you're facing in helping them learn to be more self-reliant. Kate says, my two oldest daughters are 15 and 17. My 17 year old is finishing her first year of high school. She's struggling a lot to manage her workload. My 17 year old is finishing up her sophomore year. She's doing very well academically and is trying to get a summer job this year. Thank you for sharing. So tell me a little bit about your teens and what's going on. Nancy says, my son is 13 going on 14, currently remote learning. School's difficult keeping up with the homework. So we're gonna have kids at very at various different at various levels. For kids with, we know that for kids with ADHD or other types of um, learning challenges, online school is very hard. 
is hard to maintain attention. It's hard to maintain interest. It's hard to maintain motivation. Um, and it's hard to complete things and not get distracted. So for kids right now, what's the focus? Finishing school. And do they have to finish it with the best grades ever? Probably not. I just read an article in the Washington Post that said the thing that would be most helpful for all teenagers is to have less pressure about their grades right now because they've been out of sync for so long. They have to catch up and kids are already freaked out that they've missed time, that they're not gonna measure up in various ways with college or coming back to school and, and being able to handle it. Um, Cassandra says, hi, Cassandra. My daughter attends a high school that's on a community college campus. Fantastic. She's taking college courses as well as her high, as well as high school courses and will graduate with her high school diploma and an associate's degree. That's awesome. I was very worried about how she could handle um, the course load because she's ADHD, but she has a 504 and I've worked to help her advocate for herself since she was diagnosed. Bravo, we need to teach our kids how to advocate for themselves. She's involved in every 504 meeting we have and I always allow her to speak to her teachers and tell them what she feels will help her best. Cassandra, thank you. That's a beautiful example of, sca of, of scaffolding. You're not doing it for her, which a lot of helicoptering is. In the example with my son, I could, I, I really had to hold myself back. I wanted to call the principal, I wanted to call the coach. I did none of those things. I called my friend who was a school counselor and she talked me down from the ledge. So good job, Cassandra. Um, and I like to share my parenting highlights with you as I share my parenting difficulties as well. Connie, how can we tell what, what's age appropriate as far as support for homework? My 14 year old will start high school next year. I want him to take more ownership of his schoolwork, but I hear that ADHD kids can be a bit behind emotionally. That's correct. Kids with ADHD can experience a delay in brain maturation, um, you know, in terms of the back to the front and those frontal lobes connecting with the entire brain of up to about three years. So when kids transition from middle school to high school, they absolutely need more support and scaffolding early on in terms of scheduling, homework, um, routines. And over time, we can step back we can step back a little sophomore year, step back more junior year as they start to feel comfortable. In fact, probably by the second semester of their first year of high school, we'll we may find ourselves stepping back a little bit. But initially, when they make that transition, they'll need more support. Um, Claire, uh, Connie, you're at, if you're enabling or making sure he's learning. Okay, so here's the thing. Enabling is doing it for them making sure they're learning or is setting up the structure and the situation to help them learn, teaching them the skills and repeating, repeating what you're teaching, expecting to circle back and sometimes sitting with them while they're working on something that's hard for them because your presence makes a difference. Um, so if you're re, if you're have if you're rewriting his essay to make sure it's all grammatically correct and sounds good, that might be a little more enabling. If you're letting them turn in their work as is, so the teacher can see it, that but it's completed. You've read it. It's mostly logical. There are some things you've asked him to go. You could say, hey, there's some grammatical or spelling stuff you might want to check. That's up to them. They turn it in. That is more scaffolding. Claire, my 16-year-old daughter has just fallen away from mainstream education and joined an alternative provision and is thriving in a more nurturing setting. Fantastic. I'm glad to hear that. Her mental and emotional health is very delicate at the moment, I bet. Um, she's focusing on achieving her exams, then we'll consider what is next when the overwhelm is reduced. Um, well, here's what's interesting. I was going to talk about this a little bit later, but I'm going to go here now. So. There are all kinds of things kids can do when they finish high school. It doesn't have to be go to college, whether it's um, college is an option, a four year or a two year, but there's also working for a year, vocational schools, uh, a gap year or an apprenticeship, um, which would may lead to something else. A po sometimes some athletes take a post high school year, a, a grade 13 we call it in the United States, at, an, at, a, at a school, often a private school, where they um, are getting their academic skills up while they're playing their sport in hopes of getting a sports scholarship. 
there's in the United States, we have the Job Corps, AmeriCorps. Um, there's also the military that can be an option for many kids. So there's lots of options. It doesn't have to be college. What it has to be is something that they um, actually feel some commitment to and interest in. Parent, the teenagers can be resentful of what they perceive as efforts of quote unquote overbearing parents, even though those efforts are well intentioned. So we want to start with what matters to them and what they're itching to do. And maybe they don't know what that is, and often they don't. Um, so we want to help sort of identify some choices, ask them to investigate, come back, sit down at a family meeting, talk about it, or sit with them and look it up together. Um, this can be helpful for them to kind of get a sense. Not many kids with ADHD and many kids without ADHD are not quite ready to go to college immediately, particularly kids who've struggled with learning. They need a break and that's fine. Maybe they apply to college and they defer for a year. Maybe they don't apply at all. What, what's important is what would help them because what I don't want to see happen to kids, and I've seen this a lot, is they go off to college and they're not ready and they can't handle the two aspects, the main aspects of their life. One, ac handling academics and two, handling life, laundry, eating, sleeping, managing how much you're socializing. And so they are not ready. Um, so one of the things that helps kids, of course, when they're growing up and, and their adolescence is that there are some house guidelines, like you need to be home by a certain time or, um, uh, you, you know, here's dinner. I've made dinner. Um, recently, uh, my college daughter was working on a, an artistic thesis and she made a film and she moved back home with us for three or four weeks because she couldn't handle making sure there was food and laundry and working 24 seven on her project. Um, and I was, we were okay with that. We're like, of course, come home, I'll cook. I won't talk to you, I won't bother you. You'll do whatever you want, you keep your own hours. Um, and, when, and when that happened, there was a way in which she felt free and free to do what she needed to do, but also fundamentally taken care of. And I consider this to be one of my parenting successes because I didn't have any demands for her. And I think that was really a relief because she was putting so much pressure on herself to complete an, um, her project and apply her creativity. So we want to um, figure out like, how are we gonna build trust in our kids' abilities to follow through and take care of themselves? What actions do we need to see from them um, in order to know that they can kind of make that step to college or a vocational school or AmeriCorps or whatever it is, uh, apprenticeship or the military? Um, what kinds of signs would you need to show that they're ready? And sometimes some kids aren't fully ready, but they go off to the military and, and they learn anyway because the structure is external and it's imposed on them. So let's look at some of these questions. Um, Claire says, um, okay, yep, yeah, I read that, sorry. Uh, Rita says, my son is graduating high school, congratulations, and going away to college. Awesome trying to help him get his executive functioning and ADHD balanced with other medical conditions. That's really important. So one thing that I've, that I've learned over the years is that it's really hard for kids to leave high school, leave home, go to college and manage their medical life, um, manage their, you know, the intricacies of the institution of school, manage um, sometimes, you know, um, basic needs. So one of the things that I might encourage you, and I don't consider this to be helicoptering or intrusive, is to assist your kids with transitioning to manage their own medical stuff. And that is a slow transition that can take three or four years. Even for kids who are fiercely independent, navigating the medical, the healthcare situation in your country is challenging. It certainly is challenging here. And a lot of kids don't understand insurance, what it covers, what it doesn't. And we can take that off their plate initially. They don't have to figure out what their copay is. They don't have to know if they're meeting their deductible. You know, most, many kids in the United States either get onto their healthcare plan at their college or they stay on their parents' healthcare plan if they can and for as long as possible. So we want to slowly usher them in. I remember that when my son went to college, he called me from and he's like, where do I go to get a haircut? I'm like, dude, 
you know, you're super smart and you did really well in school. I could have said that, right? But I didn't. I said, well, here's what you want to do. You want to look around, see if you walk into a place, it feels good. Um, ask your friends where they get their hair cut and you're going to have to try it out. I mean, this was a fundamental thing. I thought for sure he would know how to do that. He had no idea. So, you know, we, we want to like just lower our expectations about life skills and let them try to manage school and just self-care for a while. And then we can, you know, they can slowly take on responsibility like car insurance or um, finding a new dentist. Okay. D, my 15 year old is finishing fourth year in high school, so it's difficult to get him to be self-sufficient. I'm trying to get him to even just set an alarm so I can go to work early, but he doesn't and sleeps in. So if I get him to get himself up, he doesn't get to school. It's hard, I've supported him so much, but I need him to try and get some independence for my supports and reminders. So D, I understand that, that makes sense, but he is 15, so, um, he may not be ready for that. So I think maybe you would want to help set the alarms and I have a couple of them. Um, and then is there a consequence for being late? I know at the local high school here, if you're late twice, you, um, you get an absence and you're only allowed nine absences a semester or eight absences or something. And then if you have more absences, you have to stay after school. So I'm curious what the, the natural consequences of missing school or being late. Amy, uh, hi, I have a younger one, age 10, and I'm trying to set the stage for future successes later on. At this point, she rejects systems that we might put in place, even with her input, and that results in being late, losing work, losing items for sports. Her teachers rave about her in class, but her life tasks are a mess. We celebrate her success in school, but we're constantly caught wondering how much to do for her versus leaving her to struggle to figure it out. Will maturity help her stick to systems and accept support with organization? Yes. So remember that your 10 year old is actually in some ways like seven, maybe an organization or systems. Are you including her in creating the systems? And could you cut back on what those systems are? Let's focus on one area at a time. Maybe it's the morning routine. Maybe it's homework. We want to try to get one thing in place and feel some success about that and then move on. Uh, Anne Marie, uh, my 24 year old is working toward his bachelor degree in business analytics. He works and pays his own college. Wow. Um, my 17 year old is a senior. He works at Jersey Mike and is enrolled in Access VR. My 15 year old, unfortunately, is not doing well in math and science and will have summer school. T the time out of school has been hard. They are all responsible and organized. Awesome. D, my son Josh is a freshman in college. Time management was a big problem in the second semester. So time management is a very hard thing for a lot of people with ADHD. Um, when you are in high school, your time is structured for you. When you go to college, you have to structure your own time. And that's, <clears throat> excuse me, excuse me, that's a really big transition and it's hard for a lot of kids. And so either if you can help them structure their time, that's great. If you can get a therapist or a coach or someone at the school to meet with them in the support services, that can be very helpful as well. Um, let's see, uh, my recently diagnosed 17 year old is going to college um, and just finished a dual enrollment program a community college, I have done so much reminding, nagging, so very nervous about how we remember to do anything in college, has an ADHD coach who will continue in college. I'm learning to step back and allow him to face the consequences. Good for you, Rebecca. You know, I, I think one of the things that's really hard when our children struggle is our own anxiety about their struggle and being able to step back. And so instead of, uh, again, I would say, instead of you reminding what, how can you use technology to help remind him, how can you set up a calendar? I set up a calendar with almost all of my older teens and college age students, either online or paper that has when each class is, when their activities are, when they're gonna study, meal time, exercise time, social time. So they have an idea of how to construct a life with, you know, basically block by block. Um, so I'm glad he has support. 
Katie, I have always homeschooled my children, but I'm starting to believe that my kids need more structure than I'm capable of giving. Is public school good for kids with ADHD? Is it good to have that space away from mom and the structure that school provides? I think a public school can be good for kids with ADHD. Public school can also not be good for some kids with ADHD. It depends on your school system. The most important thing is that your children get services. Um, so make sure you get a 504 or an IEP so they're receiving the support that they need. And sometimes that structure can be really helpful. They need time away from you to figure out how to live their own life and be their own person. Sometimes not. It depends. Uh, Claire, whatever my daughter decides to do, she will need her her she will need to be supported with her executive function. She's incredibly talented and gifted, but struggles massively in the area of planning and organizing, getting started and staying with a task. So Claire, it's very clear that you, you are able to specifically identify what some of your daughter's challenges are, which is fantastic. Does your daughter agree with, the, 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 with what those are? And if so, you know, then you have a map of what you wanna work on to help her live um, more, um, more independently. Now remember, we're talking about connected independence. So you're part of things, you're talking with them about options, you're just not um, running the show. Now in terms of medical stuff or finding a coach, um, that you might be very useful. Setting up the individual coaching appointments, that will be up to your daughter. Um, I'm struggling to let her fail, but there's a lot of pressure to allow her to feel the consequences of her behavior and decisions. You know, Jessica Lay, he wrote this great book called The Gift of Failure. And it's not that she advocates your kids falling, you know, flat on their faces, but she does advocate struggling and stumbling as a way to learn from experience. And that's really what a growth mindset is about. You try something, it works out, great, you keep going. It doesn't work out you regroup, you reassess, you try something different, et cetera. Um, Janelle, your nine-year-old is in grade four. What is your thought on an age that a child should be involved in IEP meetings? Um, you know, your child could come in for the, in the beginning of the meeting and talk about, you know, what they see as their challenges, but a nine-year-old could be very um, intimidated by a room full of adults. So you want to check it out with your child and see if they want to come in and say something, but they really, I don't think they really need to be there for the meeting until they're closer to like middle school age. Cassandra, I made the mistake of being overbearing with my oldest child and I regret that I didn't just allow her to take the lead. You know, live and learn, right? That's what oldest children are for. Uh, Safia, uh, my daughter is 11 and goes to mainstream. She is struggling with other kids and understanding others. I am always complaining, but going to let her learn to deal with it herself. Right, so the thing that we want to do is open our ears and close our mouths. We want to open our ears to listen to be, to use that compassion, that second C of my five C's, to meet our kids where they are and to ask thoughtful questions so that they can come to some conclusions. If they want your opinion about what they should do, then you can say, you know, I don't know what you should do. Here's what I see are some options. Safia, I need to let her do the best she can. I always tell her I'm proud of her. Awesome. She is struggling with SATs, practice, paperwork, but I told her it's not important. I think that means SATs, but I'm not clear. Uh, D, I allowed my son to attend when discussing strengths and to share any worries he had. Otherwise, I asked him to be taken back to class. He couldn't cope for more than 15 to 20 minutes either. Thank you, D. That's really helpful. Safia, I still help my daughter with her work as she won't stay focused if I'm not there. That's okay. It's a body double kind of thing. You're there doing your thing. She's there doing her thing. If she has a question, you can reach out to her. Cassandra, I failed my first semester of college because all of the scaffolding that I had when I was in high school was removed and I floundered. Joining the military was the best thing I could have done at the time. Fantastic. It provided the structure and routine I wasn't able to provide for myself. It helped me to grow and mature. I eventually went back to college and I did make it much later and I did it much later in life. I will always be thankful for what the military did for me. Thanks for sharing, Cassandra. I have a friend who also was in the military and it really, he really helped him learn how to 
organize and be on time and um, plan things. And it taught him a lot of skills. B, yes, going away to university is where I crashed and burned, but I don't know. I didn't know I had ADHD, ADHD, OCD, and depression in addition to my depression and anxiety. I'm sorry about that, B. That sounds really frustrating. Uh, and I think the fact that, you know, we know more today and we've helped our kids get a diagnosis or get the support they need can assist them in having a better transition than we might have had ourselves. Nancy, how do you handle the medical if kids are on medication for ADHD? Um, so this is a great question, Nancy. So I think that if your kids are going to college and they're leave, or they're going somewhere where they're leaving the house, I would start working with them now on um, how to, to become more responsible for their medication. When do they get refills? How are they going to set alerts on their phone? Um, what are the, when are they going to book appointments? How are they going to book appointments in advance? How are they going to remember those? You know, you have to assist them in the transition. And that means sort of sitting with them and saying, okay, let's, um, let's, let's make an appointment at the doctor. Let me help you through that. Um, or let's, um, when you're at the doctor, let's talk about how we're going to transition your prescriptions from home to a pharmacy where you are at school. D. I'm very worried about my son attending full-time college courses doing me mechanics. He has a lot of support in high school and doesn't cope in class, so he has a one-to-one. -one. He is incredibly vulnerable and easily led. I don't think he is ready as emotionally as he is definitely younger. So, um, D, I wonder if he could take a gap year or if he could stay at home for the first year and do the classes and commute from home. Um, or, you know, is there a way to set up the kind of support in college that he has in high school? Which leads me to something I want to sort of teach about. So in high school in the United States, um, kids are mandated to, um, to, schools are mandated to identify and provide services under something called IDEA. Um, they must provide support, monitoring, and instruction if a student qualifies. In college, it's different. It's mandated compliance with ADA federal regulations. So that has to do with um, uh, disabilities. And the co colleges are not required to use accommodations or monitor students. And the thing that we sh you should know is that high school IEP or 504 plans do not automatically transfer to college. When a student goes to college, whether it's a two-year or a four-year or vocational school, the student has to check in uh, with the Office of Student Disabilities and register with them and be pre come prepared with adequate documentation. The office staff will determine the level of reasonable accommodations. The student is in charge of notifying the professors as opposed to high school where everybody knows what your IEP is. You, the, you are not necessarily the student in charge of notifying your teachers, the uh, counselor or the parents are. And that accommodations differ from modifications. Colleges don't modify the content of their classes, but they will offer accommodations through um, the, American Disabil the Americans with Disabilities Act in the United States. I don't know what it is in your country. Um, Raquel, my 19 year old daughter does not want to try ADHD medication. She has never been met medicated. Can individuals with ADHD navigate life successfully without meds? Sure. Sure. They just, what they need is executive functioning skill report. What they need executive functioning skills support a lot of it. And they, they need management tools. So that's, of course you can navigate life successfully. Um, it's sometimes easier to do it with medication, but it doesn't mean you have to. Um, Maxine, my son is 19 and has a lot of has a lot happier since leaving school and having an active job. Mornings are still a nightmare, however. I think that's the norm for kids with ADHD. Yeah, mornings are tough, and that has to do with that norepinephrine issue um, for a lot of kids, a lot of ADHD brains, which is about the time, which is about the sort of internal clock, waking and sleeping, and the regulation of that. And you know, often there is less norepinephrine in brains, so you know, getting up, getting started in the morning can be difficult. Uh, Rebecca says you're relying on a coach now. Okay, great. Um, 
uh, Karen says, I have a 12 year old high school, high functioning autistic son that will be going to middle school for the first time next year. He will be fully mainstreamed with para educator for three classes and attend a class for executive functioning skills, social skills, the special ed program. Wow, your school district sounds amazing. I'm having to learn to hold my tongue and let him answer, ask for clarification himself. Good for you. He, the kids have to learn how to ask for things. And a lot of kids um, with ADHD or other types of learning challenges don't like to ask for help. They're embarrassed. Um, they feel like they shouldn't know how to do it. They don't want to appear different than their peers. But if you can't ask, you can't get it. And so we want to slowly help our kids learn how to ask. Mary says a 504 is a must. My 11 year old is a straight A student with an E in conduct. All right then. Maria, my son is 20, graduated home high school at 19, congratulations. He is checking with his doctor to get updated documentation so that he feels comfortable attending local community college. He's been working hard at a pizza shop for a year now, cool. He's been doing different jobs at the shop as the owners really like him. His gap year ran over 2020, not the best gap year for him due to quarantine. I'm encouraging him to take it one step at a time and keep moving forward toward community college for a certificate he is interested in obtaining. Fabulous. And I want to say something about kids working. Working can be fantastic for kids with ADHD because it's an area where they can succeed and where they get positive feedback, and it's not um, testing the um, the same types of academic skills or educational or ed executive functioning skills that are tied to education, and so they really can feel um, they can get a, feel better about themselves, develop self esteem and a confidence that can then translate into perhaps going to school later. Kristen, I have enough college credits for two bachelor's degrees but still don't have a degree. I didn't discover I had ADHD until I turned 35. Today I have a 15 year, a 13 year old son and a 15 year old daughter, both with ADHD. By reflecting on my childhood and recognizing what would have helped me has helped them immensely. Thank you for sharing. That's lovely, Kristen. Heather, my son is 13, so it's challenging to think he's defiant because he's a teenager or if it's his ADHD or on the spectrum. Heather, this is true. Parents ask me all the time, well, is it ADHD, is it ASD, is it adolescence? And my answer is yes. It's all of those things in the mix in their brains. So um, are teenagers who are middle schoolers supposed to push back? You bet. Are they defiant? Yes. Is that, do we wanna put a label on, on that or just deal with the behavior? I encourage you to just deal with the behavior. Clara, thank you so much for your advice. I really feel privileged to receive your input and support. It's good to be in the room with other parent experts. I know for me, Claire, you're most welcome. Janice, does martial arts really help kids with ADHD? Martial arts can be very helpful for kids with ADHD because you're learning self-regulation in the process of actions um, and you're engaging with people in a, in a very specific way. It can be useful. Um, Kristen, however, I'm still struggling with my own ADHD and it's led to a delay in getting them both officially diagnosed. The booklet I received from the doctor's office is more than I can take on, especially since I have to fill it out for each kiddo. Any suggestions or help you can offer? Um, you know, I guess what I would say is it seems important to fill out that booklet to get the diagnosis. So maybe like fill out two pages per day um, rather than try to fill out the whole thing, which can be overwhelming. Break that booklet down. If you have a partner, give them a booklet so they can maybe do one child and you could do the other. Kate, my 15 year old is not only overwhelmed with the sheer volume of work in high school versus middle school, but it's her perfectionism mm, that really slows her down. She has assignments that have been 98% done for weeks and she can't, won't pull the trigger on turning them in. That must be so hard for her and so frustrating for you. We've tried everything we can to think, we think we, everything we can think of to um, adjust her mindset and get her to turn in assignments and accept the risk that they won't be perfect. 
So, you know, this kind of uh, perfectionism anxiety, is, I, I see this a lot in girls with ADHD and it's a compensation for the fact that they're struggling. And so they think if I can just get this right, then, you know, I'll be in better shape. I'll be okay. I won't get bad feedback, quote unquote. So instead, what I would do is, is to, um, to try turning in some assignments and, and really talking to her about the idea that there is no such thing as perfection. And that actually taking a shot and seeing what happens will serve her better than not taking the shot at all. So um, start slowly. And, and I would really think about getting her you know, some therapy to work on that kind of perfectionism anxiety. B, in Canada, there are apparently accommodation supports in post-secondary institutions. I assume in the U.S. too, remind your child to access that help. Yes, in, there, is, there, are, there, there are accommodations in the United States. They're just under a different law. So the high school, they're under IDEA, and there's man, it's mandatory to provide support and monitoring and instruction if a student qualifies. In college, the school is not going to search you out to see if you're struggling. You have to register with the, um, with the student disabilities office. You have to plead your case, and then the office will work with you on designing accommodations that make sense. Candace, having my son repeat eighth grade, I just don't feel he is ready for high school. We do homeschool and he is barely able to do what we require of him. I was undiagnosed and wish someone had given me an extra year to mature and be ready. Thank you, Candace. Nancy, you're welcome. Um, I agree, Sharon. Kids will not advocate for themselves or ask for help when needed. Does this get better as they get older or is it self-confidence, self-esteem. I think it's both. I think it does get better when they get older because they have, uh, they're, they're accustomed to how their brains are and they're ready to move on. Nancy, don't get stuck on labels. That was the hardest part as a parent. We're all different and learn differently. Oh, thank you, Heather. That's very sweet. Um, speak about internet inappropriate searches for 11 year old boy regarding sex, how to keep him safe. Um, you know, I would basically put, um, and I'm not an expert on this, but I would, uh, I would research and find someone who is, and I would put um, up uh, barriers on your computer so he can't get to those sites. Um, Alicia, any thoughts on college and distance from home? My daughter wants to go 15 plus hours away, but we are concerned with her transition uh, due to issues with EF associated with ADD. We know that she needs to go to a college that she's excited about and an environment where she feels at home. High school's not been that way. However, worry about the distance being a hurdle in her transition and our ability to support her through that. You know, I think that's really an interesting question. Um, you know, I think that sometimes kids want to go far from home to really get a break um, to, to be able to really flex those independent muscles. And what they don't realize is two hours away is different. Uh, it can feel as different as 15. It depends how you um, operate that as a family. Um, you might want to, you know, really talk about having a bridge, a gap year or a bridge where you go to community college and you get those skills or you go to a four-year college that's closer um, within driving distance. Um, just because you, you, you know, you are justifiably worried about how she's going to make that transition and how you can support her. It's very hard when she's 15 hours away. You can't like drive there. So you could say, okay, you know, you can go to college that's not immediately around here, but it has to be within one day of driving dif distance. So no more than 10 hours or whatever works for you. Um, okay. Uh, labels have helped you know what to do. Angela, thank you. Heather. Oh, that is so sweet. Thank you. <laughs> I really need to hear that. That's really nice. Okay, so we are almost at time. I would like to know if anyone has any more questions about um, emerging adulthood and how to help your kids um, kind of in their launch. I do want to say that um, Jeffrey Jensen Arnett has done a bunch of research on emerging adulthood and he identified five traits of this particular time and I want to share those with you as a part as we part. Uh, the first one is identity exploration. 
kids are still figuring out who they are well into college. And so um, we should expect that there will be gender identity exploration, sexual identity exploration, professional identity exploration. There, it's, an ex, it's a time of exploration. It's an extended adolescence in some ways. So, you know, kids sometimes feel like they have to go to college and know what they wanna do. And what I say kids is, you know, you need to go to college and figure out a little bit more about who you are and what you wanna do will come out of that. Take a variety of courses, see what interests you. Emerging adulthood is a time of instability. Things are changing. That's natural. And so, you know, kids are moving, they come home, they go away, they maybe, you know, try to live in a different place for the summer, maybe they have an internship, they study abroad, whatever it is, uh, they do an apprenticeship in another state, um, they join the military. So it is a time of great instability. And I think our job as parents is to be the stabilizing place. We're, we, you can go out and come back, you go out and come back, we're still here for you. It's a time of self-focus. Again, this is extended adolescence where adolescence is a time of great self-focus. This is a time of self-focus too. And I, I have to say that this was a hard time for, for me with my kids some because they were so wrapped up in themselves more than in high school. And I was like, oh my God, are you kidding? But yes, because they're still asking themselves questions. Who am I? Where do I belong? What do I believe? What are my values? So we should expect that there's a self-focus in this and it should be there. There's also a feeling of in between. I'm not this and I'm not that. You know, I'm not a teenager, but I'm not a real adult on my own either. I'm in between. I still rely on my parents for certain kinds of safety and health care and advice. That's okay. Our job is to let them feel in between. Okay, and then they will evolve into feeling more, um, more as a, a really a, an adult, a young or adult, uh, a little bit later. And finally, this is a time of, of, of feeling a sense of great future possibilities for a lot of kids. I think COVID has kind of knocked this on its behind. Um, because so many things were 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 really shut down and 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 kids felt deprived but i think that um you know in general emerging adulthood late adolescence is a time of so many possibilities sometimes it's overwhelming and so we want to help our kids break it down into pieces you're going to do this for now and then we'll see what happens then you're going to try this and then we'll see what happens and finally, Jan, we're going to end on Janice's question over night camps. Does it help you have some independency? I'm afraid they could think I don't want them home. Some kids really love uh, overnight camp a week or two without their parents. They feel awesome. Um, some kids don't like overnight camp. I think, it, you know, if your kids shows some interest, try it for a week and see how it goes. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Dr. Sharon Celine. Please go to my website, www.drsharonceline, enter your email, and you can get um, a free downloadable about the five C's of ADHD parenting. Um, Annie, could you put a link to my website up in, I'll do it right here um, in the chat. There you go. So make sure you check that out and you get your free downloadable. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next Friday. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye.